Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's an old friend, uh, Van Ingram. Uh, he is the executive director with the Kentucky Office of Drug Control Policy, uh, and he has supported Case Ban for many years. And welcome. And please utilize whatever time was in the schedule, and we'll just push things around. So nobody will lose any time, and we'll all. We've had some technical difficulties mm -hmm. that we have Thank you, Steve. Good to be back at Case Ban. I don't think I've been to a meeting since uh, COVID. I don't think so. And uh, schedule-wise, it just has not worked out that I could come, but I'm glad I could be here today uh, and share some information with you all about, about uh, drug policy in Kentucky and, and what's going on. Um, one of my best partners is Kiprick. Um, I could not do what I do without Kiprick. Uh, interestingly, yesterday I got an email uh, sh showing that s some states are using their opioid abatement money to set up county data profiles. And the person was saying, can we do that in Kentucky? I guess we can do it. We Kiprick did it years ago. <laughs> Here's the link to it. Uh, I've, I've joked with Terry over the years that she, sometimes she's the, they're the best kept secret in Kentucky. Uh, but I use them extensively. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that, that we do together is that, 20, is that overdose death report. And we released that just uh, uh, several weeks ago. The good news is there was a 5% reduction in deaths, although that's, the bad news is that's still six Kentuckians dying every day. We saw an increase in African-American deaths of almost 20% over the last two years. We went from a per 100,000 rate of 15 per 100,000 in 2021 to 25 per 100,000 in 2022. So that's very disconcerting um, and, and, and re requires a lot more effort on our, my part and CORE's part and, and our partners uh, to raise that awareness uh, in that community. And we're gonna continue to try to do that. In this last legislative session, there was a couple of bills of interest um, one was House Bill 353, which removed fentanyl test strips from the definition of drug paraphernalia in Kentucky. Um, we, had, we had some health departments uh, that were used doing it before the law passed, but we had others that were just very uncomfortable handing out fentanyl test strips as long as it still met that definition of drug paraphernalia in the statute. So we worked with Representative Kim Moser, ACLU, Chiefs Association, the League of Cities. A lot of people came together a lot of groups that don't usually come together uh, and, and pass what I think is a pretty good piece of legislation. Um, and we had a, it was a really great cooperative effort. When I testified, I said, if anytime you get the ACLU and the Chief, Chiefs Association on the same page, you've done something. Um, and so we were glad to get that across the finish line. Terry mentioned House Bill 248, that's the recovery housing bill. Again, a lot of people compromised, a lot of people came to the table to work on that bill. It's not perfect, but it's a good start. Um, but we have some sober living facilities in this state that are anything but sober. And it had to be addressed. Um, I wavered on it back and forth over the years. You know, sometimes you can regulate things and good people get out of it because the regulations become too onerous. I didn't want that to happen. But at the same time, we were getting some awful reports around the state of, of, of recovery housing that was preying on some of the most vulnerable people at those vulnerable times of their life um, and not providing good service. So ha something had to be done and I'm, I'm glad we were able to get that bill passed. One of the other projects that our office is working on is a recovery ready community certification. Um, that bill was passed a couple of years ago. We hired volunteers of American mid states to help partner with us on the project. We were thrilled earlier this year to name Danville and Boyle County our first recovery ready certified community. Um, since then, we've had site visits in Perry County. We've had site visits in Woodford County. And week after next, we'll have a site visit in Northern Kentucky who's filed a regional application, which is gonna be fun. Because uh, we'll be looking at Kitten, Campbell, Boone and Grant County all together to be certified as recovery ready communities. Um, it's been an exciting project to work on. Uh, and I've really been amazed at how many cities and counties, they don't get any financial reward for this, 
All they get is a certificate that says, we've worked on our recovery capital in our community and, and we are recovery ready certified. Um, but they're coming to the table every day with their applications uh, saying, well, I want to participate in that. The other bill that gives, gives us a lot of work to do is Senate Bill 90. That's a diversion program where people are brought, are, are arrested on a qualifying charge, possession of drugs, uh, minor thefts, that kind of thing. Um, they're assessed within 72 hours to see if, in fact, they do have a substance use disorder or a mental health disorder, behavioral health disorder. Um, and if so, they're offered the opportunity to go into treatment, um, to get any other skills training they need, whether that be educational, vocational, job training. Uh, they have a year to complete the program, and if they successfully complete the program, those charges that were, they were originally arrested on will be dropped. It's a pilot in 11 counties. We started in Letcher County and Kenton County. Um, we expanded July 1st into Clark and Madison County. Uh, we'll expand August 1st into Pulaski County, and so on until toward the end of the year, we'll have all 11 counties up and running. Um, so far, good results. Uh, most of the folks that have entered into the program have stayed in it. They've not not left. Um, the idea of the of the three year pilot is to show we can get better outcomes by getting people services they need, rather than warehousing them in a jail to play cards for a year and then go back out to the same life they left. Um, so I hope we can prove that that's that's the case. Uh, and this could be the future of Kentucky rather than a pilot program. So we're hopeful on that. <clears throat> I know many of you have heard about the drug xylazine. Um, we continue to receive some reports about that. I will say um, first part of the year, we tested for xylazine in over 400 overdose deaths. It was only present in about three of them. So that testing is expensive. So we suspended testing for xylazine, but as I continue to hear reports from around the state that they're showing up more places, we may have to go back to that, uh, to testing in our overdose death uh, toxicology reports. Uh, but as I say, we, we did it for 400 tests and, and the, the yield was so small that it didn't make sense to continue to do that. Um, also this year, we've, we've partnered with Case Ban, the Child Fatality Review Panel to provide uh, safe storage medication boxes. Um, our, our Kentucky ASAP State Board has voted to fund those. What was the last ask, Steve, do you remember? $50,000 in this year. Um, and the demand for those things has been huge. Uh, so that's a good thing. If we can keep any child from, from suffering uh, from an overdose uh, ingesting substances, we've made a good investment there. And we've been happy to partner with, with, with them for that. Um, Opioid Abatement Commission. I serve, I'm appointed by General Cameron to serve on the Opioid Abatement Commission. Um, so far, we've granted out $8 million in awards. Um, we are currently reviewing other proposals, um, and I suspect we'll grant out a like amount uh, in the fall. Um, so the settlement is 900 million right now, there, it, it will grow. Um, half of that goes directly to cities and counties. Uh, half of it goes to the statewide commission. You know, when I'm meeting with county officials and, and mayors, my advice is talk to your stakeholders, talk to your treatment providers, talk to public health, talk to law enforcement, talk to the people in your community that, that are a part of this get input and then develop a five year or six, five to 10 year plan. These payouts are over 18 years. So it's not like the state has 450 million right now. That's over 18 years. So it's real important that we just don't run out and say, well, what are we gonna spend it on this year? We need to have a plan. Uh, we need to think about who are the demographics we need to reach. Uh, what, what are our strategies and how are we gonna list those? Um, so the Opioid Abatement Commission, we traveled all around the state from Pikeville to Paducah to Northern Kentucky to Louisville, Lexington, everywhere. There's two things we heard over and over every city we went to. Transportation is a barrier to receiving services 
and, and recovery housing is a problem. Not enough recovery housing. Um, so those are things that cities and counties could look at right now. Um, and we hope they will. But uh, um, the other thing that, that, that we can all look at is, is how are we doing on the Loxo distribution? So core, Kentucky Open Response Effort core, they spend quite a bit of money on naloxone. My office buys naloxone for any public safety official that needs it, whether that be a correctional officer, police officer, uh, fish and wildlife, anyone, anyone with a badge that needs naloxone will pay for it. Public health spends some money on naloxone. We've been doing it for years and we still got over 2000 deaths. So the discussions I've had with, with, with my partners, behavioral health and public health, are we reaching who we need to reach? For example, I've carried naloxone since 2015. I'm an old man, I'm never out after dark. So who am I gonna run across somebody that did an overdose? Probably not. So I, what I did do, I found there was a, a, a COSAP grant in the justice cabinet that was gonna go back to uh, the feds if we didn't come up with a pl new plan to spend the money. Um, it had been dedicated to one project. That project didn't come to fruition. So right now in 24 jails and all of and 14 prisons, everybody who leaves, we offer them the opportunity to leave with naloxone. Um, most are taking it. Um, I don't care what the charge is. I don't care what the situation is. If you're leaving a correctional facility and you want naloxone, we'll pay for it. I'm thinking maybe that will help us reach more of the folks that are li likely to come in contact with someone in overdose than I will. Um, so we're, 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 we're working that strategy. That grant expires in September. Um, and I'll be really interested, Terry, to see if we had any impact on overdose fatalities or overdose incidents uh, in the months that we've, we've done this, which is May, June, July, August, and September will, will be the months that, that this has been going on. Um, so we're hopeful that that project will show some good signs, and then I'll write another grant uh, to the feds to try to keep keep it going. Next week, uh, some folks from behavioral health, public health, and myself are going to Bethesda, Maryland, to meet with SAMHSA officials. We've been chosen out of about ten states to participate in a naloxone saturation project. Um, where we'll come up with strategies uh, to, to saturate some communities with naloxone. Um, I'm thinking about the West End of Louisville. I'm thinking about some other places that that uh, we need to really target um, with, with, with naloxone saturation. And so we're gonna be working on, on a plan to do that next week. That's about all I had to share with you, but I'm happy to answer any questions or have any discussion that you would like. Yes. Yeah, so for those of you on Zoom who didn't hear the question, the discussion was, uh, could naloxone be put in places where homeless folks and, and other folks that are at danger would be gathering, like uh, grocery stores, uh, convenience stores, that type of thing. I think that's a good part, a good strategy to explore. Um, <clears throat> nalox boxes have been controversial in a few places. I'm all for them. Um, we do have to figure out how to make sure that somebody doesn't come in and take it all uh, and, and hoard it, um, for lack of a better term, or try to sell it on the street. Um, so we, we need some safeguards in place for that. Um, but I think that's a good idea. I think placing it, placing them where people can anonymously go and get it will, I think, help increase getting in the hands of those folks that need it the most. Yes, sir. One of the things I ran into a couple years ago when um, I was interfacing with, with public health and they were talking about their naloxone program to see what they were contributing. And I 
ask about getting it to a volunteer fire department number, and they said we can't under our grant distributed to those folks. Um, we were able to leverage some money countywide through county government to get it with all our first responders out in the county. I, I know there's avenues for law enforcement, but that's another avenue in some of the counties. I know they're having trouble being able to fund it, you know, because they just don't have the money. Um, and I'm hearing that from a few different people. But are there avenues for those kind of agencies to be able to access it? Yeah. Um, you contact Marie Winfrey uh, at the Department of Public Health. So they've had a, what's called a FR CARE grant to provide that services to volunteer fire departments and others. It started out with about 30 Eastern Kentucky counties. It's grown to about 70. And my understanding is on their next grant proposal, which would take part in October, that it was going to nearly cover the state. And that may have been one they ended up getting. I, I was a little bit past from it, but it, yeah. it was odd when I asked about it. If I had just gone in and said, I want you yeah. know, not told them why I wanted it, I could have got one. But it was yeah. once I, I told them it was for a policy for our department, I was like, we can't do that. So, you know, every grant has their restrictions. <laughs> and sometimes they don't make any sense, but they're, they're there. And I'll follow back up with them. But yeah, I, I think uh, that FR CARE grant is going to nearly cover the state uh, starting in October. So, uh, and, and you know, these counties and cities that come into money, that should be a discussion about naloxone. No, you know, uh, uh, first responders in, that, in every every county should have access to that. Uh, that's a, We helped them distribute. We've got an all attorney in sorority houses, and we just finished placement in the uh, all the residence halls with the AEDs, and we're going to roll that out to all the residents when they come back. It's there ready uh, and accessible. Well, thank you for that. That makes so much sense. There's a lot of good partnerships out there to do that, um, and uh, and we and we're working on the training element of it too to, to let folks know that you know one dose may not do it. Mm -hmm. you need to. to Avail yourself of you know the, the emergency response process, uh, but, but the initial two doses were there for them, you know, to have access. You know, with 107 to 10,000 Americans dying every year, every place there's a defibrillator, there should be a naloxone. It just makes sense. Um, I still have that argument with people that uh, I shouldn't be spending all this money on naloxone, but um, as long as I'm here, I'm going to continue to do it. Uh, Another good idea. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure about how much PR marketing has been done on this, like maybe some PSAs. Um, I'm just finding that in my community, uh, there's so many people who do not know anything about the existence of the you know, um, They'll say, that, you know, you mentioned the word and there's a the, what is that? You know, I may have heard about it, but what yeah. is that? Yeah. And so I just think some real life. Yeah. And to get that, that education. So it can be done in so many diversified ways. It's not for this health professional, but there's an, uh, and also faith based. I'm trying to get our, our more of our faith based organizations involved with being knowledgeable about it, first of all, and, and also to destigmatize the fear about I'm afraid that I might hurt that person. <laughs> When I do this, you know, but this is empowering them to know that this can be done and how it can be done. So the education and also they don't know that they don't know mm -hmm. is one of the issues that I'm finding. Yeah, so the folks on Zoom, the, the discussion was about so many folks don't even know what naloxone is. They don't know how to distribute it. They don't know how to use it. They may or may probably don't know that there's a civil immunity, civil and criminal immunity from applying naloxone. 
Um, so later this year, part of that fentanyl test strip bill um, required my office and Cabinet for Health and Family Services to do a joint fentanyl awareness and education campaign. I'm gonna take what you suggested back to the table with the vendor that's gonna do that for us and ask that some discussion of naloxone be included in that fentanyl awareness and education campaign. I think that's a good idea. I think it's good, we could, I think we can marry those two things and it will make sense. Yeah, you know, we had to change language in the statute because now there are opioid reversal agents that are not Narcan. Um, and, and so we have to be careful with the language we use um, because there are products out there that will re re reverse an overdose, but they're not Narcan so, or naloxone. So, um, but we certainly need to do more education. I, I just signed a contract with the Kentucky Broadcasters Association to have a PSA run on every Kentucky radio station and 19 TV stations once a day. Um, what I started doing was promoting 8338KY Help, our statewide call center. Terry and I had a discussion yesterday about findhelpnowky.org, and if we're not constantly promoting these things, people forget, to your point, they forget they exist, or they don't know they exist. Um, and both Terry and I have spent a lot of money promoting those products, but it feels like it's never enough. Last year, I was doing trainings for police chiefs, how many of you have heard of 8338KY Help? Like crickets. How many of you have ever seen Find Help Now KY.org? Very few hands go up. Um, so I went ahead, we did, we, we, I worked with one of Terry's folks and one of the folks from 8338KY Help, and we did a two minute roll call video to train police officers in. Here are these two resources, they're available to you. Every day you come in contact with somebody that touches substance use disorder. Here's an easy way to make a referral. You should call this number, go to this website. Um, so we, we, we gotta constantly be promoting that. Uh, th those, those things that are out there, the lock zone, uh, you know, a tool to help people find treatment, a number you can call and people will help do a screening and referral and help you locate the right treatment for you. Uh, so many of those things are so important. Um, but there's never enough dollars. You know, and, and, and we, we've got millions of dollars in Kentucky devoted to this, but there's, there's just so much need for so much stuff. Yes, sir. And I should notice that is there anyone in Kentucky that does the, the boxes? Like you, you so there was one in Vine Grove for a while. Um, we're, de, we're working on one, a kiosk designed in Hazard, Kentucky for actually a syringe service program uh, vending machine. Um, black, black box in the lax box in Northern Kentucky. There's a few around. Um, I was in, uh, I won't name the town. I was in a, a town last week and, uh, tried to promote this idea along with someone from their public health department and, <clears throat> and their first responders had, had no interest in it whatsoever. So still a lot of work to be done. Um, but. I have to say, Indiana's way ahead of us on the locks boxes, and we need to get more promotion of that. Uh, yeah, they've been very aggressive with the locks boxes. And they also said there's a lot of pushback. Yeah, um, we are working on getting it in schools uh, more prevalently. Um, there's an effort underway to do that, but yeah. Dr. Brenzel, my friend in Baylor House, says we, we need to tape it to the guardrails along the highway. You know, <laughs> they need, need to be everywhere. Anybody else? Well, not thank you. I appreciate being here with you. We'll stay for a little while. I can't stay all day, Steve, but I'll stay for as long as I can. <laughs> <laughs>